The altimeter levels off at around 900 feet. Slowly, she starts to climb. She is gaining altitude. The pilot signals, or oh. Three hours later, at the base, the crippled plane comes into sight. Men peer closely, tense, hushed, as they see the starboard prop dead. A one engine landing is tricky at best. With skis, on ice, hold your fingers crossed for the pilot. Safe, safe, good going. The greatest exploration flight of all history has ended in success. The flight beyond the South Pole. The flight beyond imagination. But over the Pine Island with the Eastern group is the shadow of tragedy. Captain Dufek flashes the word by radio. To Eastern Task Group, from Task Group Commander, Mariner George 1, overdue. This group commenced standard search and rescue operations immediately. Grim men with grave news from Captain Dufek. No time now for jubilation over his own escape. No mood for rejoicing. Bird knows better than any man the tragic import of the message. In the freezing danger of the Antarctic, seconds are hours. Minutes are days. Every resource of the expedition must be mobilized instantly. All planes must take the air. All men stand alert for emergency duty. Over the ice pack, above the open sea, across the barrier. Mariner George 1 is down with men. No radio signals coming through. That means a crash. Search. 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 Wherever the plane is, it must be found. For maddening, anxious days, fog shrouds the area where the accident most likely took place. Men are frantic. Yet daily, at their own request, at their urging, in fact, the crew of the Pine Island gathers for prayer service. On the 13th day, the weather breaks clear. Captain Dufek sends another PBM into the area, heretofore shrouded in fog. At last, in clear visibility, the pilots and men scan water and pack ice along the Phantom Coast. Wherever they are, the nine men of the George I have been lost almost two weeks. Hope is thin. Five hours out, Commander Howell, the pilot, spots smoke, a signal fire. Some are alive down there. How badly hurt? How many live? The George I smashed. The wreckage scattered, some of it burned and a message on the wing. Lopez, Henderson, Williams, dead. No seaplane can land on the ice. Can the survivors reach open water? Howell must drop a message. We'll land barrier's edge 10 miles north. We'll drop flags to mark trail. If you can walk it, form circle. If not, form line. Howell knows the gravity of the decision Captain Caldwell must reach. But if the men can walk, a day may be saved. A precious day for the engine. Howell flashes the news. Captain Dufek gets the word and gives it to the Pine Island by loudspeaker. Attention all hands. This is the task group commander speaking. Mariner George 1 has been sighted. Rescue operations are in progress. Howell circles his PBM over the wreckage. He watches for his answer. The huddle of men breaks apart. They've reached a decision. It's a circle. They'll try the 10-mile trek to board the PBM at the water's edge. Howell's crew have the relief gear ready now for the men below. Cargo chutes float the heavy packages down. First aid boxes, rations, skis, blankets. For men hungry, cold, hurt, and losing hope, the chutes are as lovely as shining stars. Symbols of life restored, of return to families who've been waiting and praying. Now to mark the trail. The PBM's crew have hundreds of flags, each weighted to land and stay upright. If fog should again close in on this desolate coast, there must be no second disaster, no wandering from the road to rescue. The survivors follow the trail markers. Five able to walk, one on a sled, ten miles to go. These men are marching out of the shadow of death into the sunshine of life. Aboard the rescue plane, ready to leave the barrier edge, the survivors, six thankful men, jerk out their story in bits and flashes. How Henderson, Lopez, and Williams died in the crash and explosion when they smashed up in milk bowl visibility. How they found scattered cans of food, a stove, and fuel to keep it going. And one tube of sulfur tablets, just enough to keep Frenchy LeBlanc 
their gravely injured pilot barely alive. Proudly, they tell how Captain Caldwell consulted them all in dividing their little food, how he kept watch, inspired their faith, and how they prayed, as men always do, when there is no other hope but prayer. Bill Kearns, co-pilot, grins hello. First off is Frenchy LeBlanc. Corman carry him tenderly in a stoke stretcher. Moore and Robbins pulled him out of the blazing nose of the plane, but his back, hands, and face suffered third-degree burns and in the Gethsemane of waiting for rescue, both legs were frozen to the knees. Amputation is inevitable, but he will live. The ship's company of the Pine Island greets their skipper, Captain Caldwell, observer on the flight. He says no ship ever looked so good to him as his own command, as again he sets foot on her decks. His executive officer greets him with sincere affection. Captain Dufek warmly welcomes the survivors. Co-pilot Kearns, his broken arm in a sling. McCarty, photographer. War, the radio operator. And smiling Shorty Robbins, the motorman. The head is warm. A hot bath, clean sheets, and long hours of restoring sleep. And perhaps first, a moment to splice the main brace by which good sailors mean a ration of medicinal spirits, bourbon to you. Later in sick bay, all but Frenchie and Captain Caldwell enjoy their first full meal in two weeks. Kearns will go to Georgetown University to study for a career in diplomacy. McCarthy, who has a wife and two children in Sonoma, sunny California, beams happily. Robbins, who was the wheel horse in those desperate days, figures to keep on flying. He still loves it. And War knows that he will marry his school teacher, sweetheart, back in Reading, Pennsylvania. News of the rescue finds the icebreaker with Admiral Cruzen fighting her way through thickening ice to pick up Admiral Byrd and his men at Little America. Byrd is radioed for all speed. At the base, the Admiral supervises Operation Secure. All essential records and scientific instruments are to be taken home. The planes must remain. They are stripped down with the hope that another American expedition in a future year, may find them of use. Supply dumps are marked by poles. And now through the capes comes the old reliable workhorse, the icebreaker. Final loading is the order. All roads lead to the bay, the last trip down. The last long trek through the snow for the big go-devil sledges loaded with men and equipment. The excitement that always comes with sailing infects all hands, including the dogs. They sniff something important is in the wind. With normal quarters for 75, the icebreaker must jam aboard the additional 197 men of the base body until after the voyage north, she can transfer personnel to the big ships awaiting her at Scott Island. Bird is among the last aboard. He can now report to Admiral Nimitz, Operation High Jump completed. Our men have achieved accomplishments unparalleled in the history of discovery. Our central group has flown far beyond the South Pole, mapped one-third million square miles never before seen by man. Our eastern group mapped 3,000 miles of Phantom Coast and charted 40,000 square miles of coastal ocean areas hitherto unknown. Our western group flying hundreds of air hours mapped the 4,000-mile Sunset Coast, made the amazing discovery of warm land in Antarctica. In all, the expedition explored more than a million and a half square miles. Our scientists, by use of the radar magnetic detector, have pinpointed fabulous treasures and resources of great significance for all mankind. The men who did the job, Navy, Army, Air Corps, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and scientists, are going home. Tired men, the rear guard of Admiral Byrd's intrepid 4,000, veterans of the Antarctic, trained to combat the sub-zero enemy of the polar continent. They're going home to their mothers, sweethearts, wives, children. Home, strong in the knowledge that they have met the Antarctic's heaviest battalions and conquered them. This is to be their lifelong reward, this knowledge and the Navy's highest commendation. Well done.